Hi, uh, this is Chris Harris and Dom Burden. We work at the uh, Eye Infirmary in Plymouth, uh, where we run a, a clinic of uh, people with eye movement disorders. And nystagmus is probably the most common condition that we see. Nystagmus is a um, spontaneous oscillation of the eyes, and I'm sure you are very well aware of that. It can start at any age from birth onwards. Um, the eyes can move in pretty much any direction, horizontally, vertically, uh, around and around. They can also wobble together, but sometimes one eye may, may be more affected than the other. The stagmus can be there all the time, or sometimes it can occur uh, transiently where it comes and goes. However, for some people, the nystagmus may cause the uh, visual world to wobble or drift, uh, which we call oscillopsia. Oscillopsia can be um, very debilitating, but not everyone gets it with nystagmus. There are really two broad categories of nystagmus, uh, one on the left here called developmental nystagmus and the one on the right here called acquired nystagmus. Developmental nystagmus has an onset in infancy or birth. Uh, it is usually permanent and lifelong. It is usually caused by congenital visual def defects, although sometimes we can never find a cause. Most patients with uh, developmental nystagmus do not complain of oscillopsia, although I would, would not say that they don't see it, it's just not a common uh, phenomenon. And the types of developmental nystagmus are infantile nystagmus and uh, fusion male development nystagmus. Now, acquired nystagmus has an onset typically after infancy. Um, it may be permanent also, or it can be transient. Uh, it is usually caused by a neurological disorder. And for these people, nosolopsy is common, but not universal. And there are many types of acquired nystagmus. So in terms of uh, clinical investigations, developmental nystagmus, we're really looking for visual causes, whereas in acquired nystagmus, we're usually looking for a neurological explanation. Within neural uh, nystagmus network, uh, most uh, members and their families uh, are, have infantile nystagmus syndrome, uh, but there are a few uh, members with acquired nystagmus as well. There are many types of acquired nystagmus, as I said, um, and I've listed a few here. That's not exhaustive, but these are the more common types. And actually identifying which kind of nystagmus does help in trying to find the underlying neurological explanation or cause for the nystagmus. And the most common causes are um, brain lesions, such as stroke or tumours. Um, but drug toxicities are, um, also occur, whether it's prescribed drugs, such as anticonvulsants, or unprescribed drugs, such as alcohol, etc. And some people have neurodegenerative conditions where things gradually get worse and worse, and often these are inherited as well. When it comes to treatments, if we put all the types of nystagmus together, a variety of things have been tried. Uh, eye muscle surgery, uh, where the eyes, uh, the muscles are real, realigned, to sometimes to slacken the, uh, the eyes so they wobble less. Instead of surgery, one can use botulinum toxin as a temporary paralysis of the muscles. Tenotomy is where the muscles are uh, taken off and then put back on again. It um, affects how the brain controls eye movements. Visual things such as contact lenses and prisms have been tried. Um, acupuncture, feed, biofeedback and head and neck stimulation have apparently been useful for some people. One can try and stabilize the image on the retina, which is difficult to do, but that's possible. Even magnets have been tried uh, to try and reduce the eyes from wobbling. But certainly for acquired nystagmus, the most common uh, approach has been to look at drugs. When we consider a drug therapy, we need to uh, identify which type of nystagmus uh, the patient has. Here we have a list of potential drugs that can have been shown to have some effects on people with downbeat nystagmus. On the left is the drug name and the middle column here is the study 
uh, itself and on the right is the number of patients have been used in those studies and as you can see a number of drugs have been used uh, to to help people with downbeat nystagmus this is the studies for pendulum nystagmus uh, not so many but still quite a few studies and other nystagmus types such as upbeat periodic alternating and torsional and seesaw nystagmus have have also been looked at overall the the effect of drugs has not been overwhelming um, some drugs work for some people not for others and this doesn't seem to be a lot of science behind it so let's look at oscillopsia as i've said before this is the illusion that the world is moving or wobbling when in reality it is not uh, oscillopsia can be a transient phenomenon uh, and it occurs when people move their head such as when they're walking this is caused by a vestibular disorder um, and, and when the head's kept still there usually is no oscillopsia I won't be talking about this uh, condition um, people with nystagmus uh, tend to have a permanent type of oscillopsia it occurs all the time or as long as the nystagmus is occurring and it may occur in certain di gaze directions and one might say it's caused by the nystagmus it it can be quite overwhelming and debilitating so what actually causes the oscillopsia the answer may seem obvious it's a nystagmus of course but it's not that simple and uh, let's try and see why this is a picture of my cat um, her name's Pumpy because she's quite plump and she's a very pretty cat but you need to look at you need good vision to be able to see her now let's um, imagine you were looking at point A over here when you're looking at point A she would be in your right visual field and if you look at A, look at A yourself you'll see that she's very blurry if instead we looked at point B she would be in my left visual field and again she would be blurry so now let's do a little experiment I want you to look at point A and then look at point B and go back and forth and you, what you'll see is that as you do that uh, she's a bit blurry because she's not on your central vision but actually she doesn't move even though of course your eyes are moving she stays still and this is called visual constancy and you know we move our eyes all the time yet we don't see the world as moving even though the images of things we look at must be moving across our retinas at quite high speeds the brain uh, um, seems to work out that uh, or anticipate how much the image should move and, and then compensates for it so that the perception of the world remains steady and stable this perceptual trick requires uh, uh, extra information which we call extra retinal information outside the eye and the most likely cause or source of this information is the motor command itself called efference copy so that when the brain makes a move uh, make, makes a movement it knows what the command was and uses that to compensate for the perceptual movement so that you see the world as being steady so you can see that because the even though the image moves across the retina it do, does not mean that you will necessarily see things as moving so why do people get oscillopsia let's see if I can illustrate what's going on here so here's a picture of, uh, of, of the target which is the cat of course in the middle here and this circle here the blue circle is your field of view if you like imagine it's a camera and that's the field of view of your camera so um, let's assume that the camera or your eye is moving because of the nystagmus and what you'll see is what's going on here is that the although the object you're looking at stays still it's clearly uh, moving within your visual field and so from perceptual point of view uh, you will see the object moving even though of course the object's not moving but it's your eyes that are moving I hope that, that makes sense now let's imagine that you could compensate for your eye movement or the camera movement and move the object just at the right uh, speed to match the speed of the camera then what you'd see would be something like this 
Now, of course, the object is it really is moving because you're making it move now, but it's also moving with your field of view. So from the perceptual point, you see a steady image, even though both things are moving. So that's that's retinal stab stabilization, and uh, we can actually make that happen in the laboratory. Now, um, so what the first situation was was there is no uh, no efference copy, and then when I just shown you this one, there's full efference copy, and we can get a partial situation as well. So, uh, let's have some partial feedback. So here's here's your uh, field of view is oscillating the blue circles moving but the image is also moving but not quite matching the the, uh, the movement of the of the camera or eye the perception is less there's motion but it's less than your eye movement and so um, you can get this in between stage as well so why do some people have oscillopsia and others don't it seems that the extra retinal information is lacking or damaged in some people and it's possible that there may be a spectrum of, of, of oscillopsia ranging from no oscillopsia to full os oscillopsia. But actually, we don't know the answer to this. And the reason we don't know why is because no one's ever me measured it. If you look at all those studies I showed you, uh, all of them recorded eye movements, um, but they only recorded the nystagmus. And of course, that doesn't tell you about the perception of oscillopsia. It doesn't measure the efference copy, for example. Other studies have looked at visual acuity, but visual acuity uh, uh, just tells you uh, how well you can see a static image, like when we're looking at the cat. It doesn't tell you about the effects of motion or, or the perception of, of motion itself. Some have used questionnaires to ask about the oscillopsia, which is a move in the right direction, but of course it is very qualitative and doesn't really get to the, the nub of the matter. So can we measure oscillopsia? Well, um, there have been very few measurements of it itself. Uh, we propose to explore a method to ascertain a person's degree of oscillopsia, and the idea is to record a person's nystagmus and move the visual stimulus in synchrony with the nystagmus. I mean, the experiment has been done in the past, but only on people with infantile nystagmus syndrome. And the results was quite surprising. It showed that when the image was stabilized on, on the retina, the peop people with INS actually saw the world as moving, even though the image is completely steady on their retina. And, and this is a proof that their extra retinal information is, was intact reasonably normal and that's why they don't complain of oscillopsia but this has not been done on people with acquired nystagmus i think it's been assumed that they have oscillopsia so there would be no point so the question is it remains open do they have efference copy has it been damaged and uh, or is there are some other cause for their oscillopsia and no one knows so using this approach we could, in principle, measure how much oscillopsia a person has and how much efference copy you have. And we can use this measure, we could, in principle, use this method to obtain an outcome measure to look at the efficacy of treatments for oscillopsia. So rather than measuring their visual acuity um, or looking at their nystagmus, we can actually look at their oscillopsia to see how well drugs, for example, might affect it. But here we run into a problem because doing these kinds of uh, studies are technically difficult and as you might imagine, it requires money and expertise. We propose a project that would be a collaboration between us in Plymouth and John Erickson's group in, in Cardiff, because they have uh, a lot of expertise using the eye trackers. But to persuade anyone, particularly the National Institute for Health Research, NIHR, or possibly some other funding body, uh, to, to get then persuade them to give us money requires that the, they must perceive the project as being worthy of funding. And of course, there's a lot of calls for money for lots of conditions. So what we need to be able to do is convince uh, potential funding bodies that oscillopsia is a really big problem, which it is, of course, but we need to convince them of it. 
So this kind of requires people with oscilloscopy to get together and start making some noises and saying how we need to fund these kind of things. So I was wondering whether a nystagmus network could help. If uh, all the members with acquired nystagmus could get together and, um, and, and form a kind of a group, um, perhaps to, to emphasize the problems of oscillopsia, it might be very useful and might help in us getting funding. Anyway, so that's the end of my talk. I think uh, I understand that there might be some questions, so over to you.